Hello, creatives. Welcome back to Girl Gang Craft, the podcast. Today, we have Elizabeth Styles with us all the way from the UK. Hello, Elizabeth. How's it going? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How's it going with you? It's good. I'm so glad we could finally connect. We've been doing a little back and forth, and here we are sitting down to have the conversation. Um, y'all, you all listening are going to find this very aligned. Um, Elizabeth's uh, work and the GGC community are um, have a lot of similar ethos, um, a lot of similar just uh, you know medicine and and education. So. We're going to just hop right into the conversation. Elizabeth, tell everyone, you know, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Before I start, I can't see my audio going up and down. It's going up and down on me, so it seems to be good. fine. (laughs) And you can hear me, so it's all good. (laughs) So, hello, I am Elizabeth Stiles. I am a fashion brand consultant, and I work with independent mainly women but uh, creatives let's say on their manufacturing marketing and mindset so my background is in fashion buying and also I worked as a sales manager sort of selling into buyers so seeing both sides of the coin there was really great and I left my job in 2018 to work with smaller businesses and never really looked back. So, yeah, what made you leave your job? What made you decide to go out on your own and sort of switch uh, gears a little bit? Yeah, so I had worked in the fashion industry for about 12 years and I felt a bit bored, maybe, and it it felt really vapid. So there wasn't a huge amount of purpose in my work necessarily, which never bothered me before, but... I think once I hit 30, it did start to bother me for whatever reason. And I just had this internal sort of woo voice saying, it's time to go now. Your time is done here. We're moving on to the next thing, which was great. But this voice never told me like what the next thing was. So I felt like ready to go. But I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing. So I had lots of thoughts about retraining as something you know maybe I am a bit bored of the fashion industry um maybe I could train to be a teacher or you know go into fitness I didn't really know and then I was lying in a yoga class at the end in shavasana pose which is great and I remember just like throwing myself sat bolt upright being like oh my god I'm so stupid like I could just teach people the thing that I know like why am I trying to retrain as something when I've got over a decade of experience in the fashion industry and I think I'd just taken for granted what I know because I had studied fashion retail I'd worked in fashion retail therefore my friends were in fashion retail so everything that I knew they knew But then I didn't really think about outside of that bubble, how many other people there are who don't know how to source fabrics, work with factories, market something on Instagram. And so that's probably where it started. And I just remember coming home really excited to tell my boyfriend, like, I'm going to leave my job. like I'm going to do it on my own. And he was like, yeah, I don't really understand what you're saying, but it sounds great. Like, go for it. And that was fine. That was probably like part one. And then part two was coming to terms with giving up my salary, which is obviously very, very, very scary. Um, So I got a part time job in order to leave. Um, That didn't actually last too long, because then I got a freelance job, which paid a lot better. Um, And so I did that for about 18 months in the first like few months of the business, which really supported me and allowed me like the freedom to let my business grow at the right pace rather than trying to like really force it to work um I could sort of take it easy because I had a bit of a buffer financially from the freelance thing that I was doing on the side so I think what you said something um about you know everyone around you was in fashion and so uh, not really 
<clears throat> processing the need for what you do beyond that bubble. And I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of us are seeing that in real time, um, both in person and digitally, uh, being like my, you know, my for you page and my Instagram home is a lot of creatives, but also a lot of people who are doing similar work, like doing yes. business coaching, doing creative business coaching. And it's hard to remember that everyone that we're talking to, uh, they might not have their page and their circles looking like that. You know, we might be the only uh, business coach in their creative little bubble. And so I think that's really fascinating because we don't really understand the need for our services once we, uh, before we step beyond our little circle, we may never step beyond our little circle. And um, it, it might feel a little bit weird that we're just sort of talking to the abyss or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, my sister-in-law actually said something really funny the other day. She was like giving some advice to one of the kids in the family. And she was like, why don't you learn an instrument? Like everyone's learning an instrument these days. And we were like, are they you like what makes you say that and she was like oh it's all like it's plastered all over my Instagram everyone's learning an instrument and I was like I think what's happened here is that you've watched one video of somebody learning an instrument and then they think you're interested and they've just pushed that like my feed doesn't have anybody learning an instrument and then everyone went around the room and was like no me neither me neither and I actually saw something really interesting on TikTok that was like how trends aren't going to be the same anymore because everyone's little algorithm makes them believe that what they're seeing is on trend and so nobody really knows what's on trend because everybody is seeing their own little bubble and everyone lives in their own little bubble of their own algorithm um and so it's like you know oh fluffy white trousers are on trend and (laughs) because that's all you're seeing and it's like no no it's not it's just a little loop that you've got yourself into it's it's kind of weird it's totally fascinating yeah um okay but so we're talking backing up a little bit so bringing up the part-time job I think is really interesting um because so you left your full-time job and you sort of knew that you needed some financial support as you started to get uh things going which I think is really key here. And not that many people talk about, because some people make the leap or some people are sort of doing their full time and the side hustle. But I the I find that the part time and the and the business growing gives you a little bit more space for actually building the business. Because if you have a nine to five, you're tired. So yeah. if you can <laughs> if you can find something that's part time, maybe you're ready to leave your nine to five and sort of uh, downgrade that time being dedicated to something else. I know I was waitressing and teaching yoga, so I had space and time during the day to build GGC. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that part-time job and like how you balanced? Yeah. So I, for like full transparency, I used to take home maybe like 2000 pounds a month in my job, but really, you know, I had a lot of travel costs because I was going in and out of London. And so just to cover my bread and butter basic needs for running my life, I think at the time, this is like five years ago, I needed £800 to survive, to make sure that the bailiffs don't come around my door, to put like some basic food on the table, to feed my cat. I was like, I need £800, so how can I make that? And so it was very like methodical. um, And I thought if I get a job at a stationery shop down the road and I do four hours a week, I think I was going to earn, I mean, maybe it was like eight hours a week. I can't remember, like one day a week and I would earn 400 pounds. So I was like, okay, that covers half of the basic needs. And then it's, I can make up the other half from trying to grow the business. And maybe that's like three or four, hour long sessions with people I think I could do that over the space of a month and then it's just grew from there but funnily enough I actually only lasted in that stationery shop for two weeks because once I had put it out on my social media like I've left my career I'm doing this on my own opportunities do come your way from talking about what it is that you do and what it is that you want And so a guy from my old job messaged me and said, I'm working with this factory, they need to grow their business in the UK, 
I, you know, obviously, as you remember, I'm a designer, you were a sales manager, how about partnering up and we can grow the business in the UK together for this factory. And where the stationery shop was paying me like eight pounds an hour, he was going to be paying me 40 pounds an hour. So it was a bit of a no brainer that I could do it during the week as well and get my weekends back because I was having to work in the stationery shop at the weekends. And it just felt good. And despite thinking, oh God, I've just got rid of that career and now I'm basically going back to it. It was more like, I know how to do this and I'm going to do it on my own terms, in my own hours. Let's see where it goes. And so, yeah, I did that for about 18 months whilst I was building relationships with people, going to networking events. It just removed that like desperation, which I think customers can smell from a mile off um and just being like you know having discovery calls with people being like let me know like come back to me when you're ready rather than being like please please book in um which really does repel people and I think when you're not worried about money it's so much easier to be creative and come up with really good ideas and um have the time to go to these maybe like luxury little luxuries that are taking a few hours out of your day to go to a networking event where you're not being paid if anything you might have to pay to go to it um yeah it just felt nicer to have that financial pressure like alleviated and letting the business grow at its own pace rather than a forced pace so what about you when you started like you said you did waitressing and yoga was it a sort of time frame Um, yeah, so waitressing, I mean, really allowed me to, uh, to pay for my life. Um, really did. So, and, you know, I was working, let's see, like four to 10, four to 11 or something. Um, so I could use my daytime to, to work on GGC. And I was also teaching yoga at the time too. And so those were sort of mix and matching. And, um, yeah, I mean, I I actually that redressing money was very key (laughs) (laughs) I read a really good book actually called the multi-hyphen method by a woman called Emma Gannon here in the UK and it's all about exactly like you said you know I'm a community leader slash yoga teacher slash waitress and it did open my eyes a little bit to think oh you don't need one career you just need one like number like the income to come in but it doesn't matter how it's made up it doesn't have to be from one place it can be like that same number but divided up into three and I don't know just growing up you always you know you have a career and actually with the introduction of the internet it doesn't have to be so linear yeah, and in one of our podcasts, we interviewed um, Camly, who's a couple episodes ago. If you're listening now, um, and she's a full, she, you know, I had no idea that she had a full time job. Also, you know, she's a content creator in LA. It really looked like she was doing the thing, and her preference is to have a full time job. I mean, I think that's really fascinating and a really, um, you know, we see all these people doing all these things, growing their business, and we're in comparison mode, and we're like, okay, mm-hmm. well, I need to do my job now and do this full time, but like you don't. And like, it's okay to be having multiple jobs. And um, there's a lot of benefits for that. Like you said, the creativity, I think that's really true. And just like, um, I mean, the ability to feel secure and like that you can pay for your rent and you know where the money's coming from. Like that's that's very important. Business as well. Like the business takes money to grow, even something like a service led business where you think from the outside, you know, you see the videos like all you need is a laptop and you can work from the beach, but you also need to pay for your Squarespace subscription. All you need to software. pay for your Flowdesk subscription. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for it to work and for it to do well. And, you know, I needed headshots. And all of a sudden, there is a little bit more expense needed. And I was able to pay for that comfortably. Well, not that comfortably, in all honesty. Like, it makes it sound like I was fine. It was very, very tight those first few months. But it was easier than if I didn't have that job let's say that so who was your customer starting off initially my customer was somebody who wanted to start a fashion brand 
or had just started a fashion brand but didn't have a fashion background so maybe you were a hairdresser and you wanted to start a fashion brand so you might understand the front end of running one but you definitely don't understand the back end of running one so things like fabric sourcing finding a factory negotiating prices making sure the production runs smoothly that back end kind of boring stuff maybe is the thing that I enjoyed helping people with and I knew that there was a niche there for it as well because loads of people talk about Instagram and you know in the end I've ended up talking about it too because it's such a huge part of running the business but nobody at the time was talking about manufacturing and so it was something that I knew how to do I didn't love it but I did enjoy helping other people avoid costly mistakes in the manufacturing process because there is a lot to know. And if you've never worked in it, why would you know? And so the other part of it is like the fashion industry is so secretive and people like thinking, oh, I worked really hard for this information, like you're not having it or it's all about who you know and you don't know anybody. It's so hard to break into that industry. And I had a really awful experience in one of my jobs it was kind of devil wears Prada situation and I didn't want anybody to feel like everybody in the fashion industry is like that like you can totally be a nice person and work in the fashion industry at the same time which is where my whole like friendly face in fashion came from and I thought you know if you are a lawyer and you want to start a fashion brand why not I'll help you so that was definitely where it started and so um you mentioned like consult calls or coaching calls was that your primary um offer starting out and what are what do your offers look like today and what does your audience look like today let's sort of uh, zoom out a little bit yeah so at the beginning I did just trade time for money which is a really easy way to begin to be like one hour costs this and that was really it I did a day rate and very quickly realized that if I was only selling once to people, I was going to be selling all the time, which is really exhausting. So I tried to then have a one hour call or a one day with somebody and then book like six monthly sessions after it, which was the closest thing I could come to in and still have come to probably in predicting an income to think, okay, well, if I get 10 clients paying a couple of hundred pounds a month, that will somehow duplicate my salary. And then everything else can go on top, which is great. So from a a product perspective, when lockdown hit, it didn't affect me that much, really, because a lot of my work was on Zoom already but I couldn't go and meet people for intensive in-person days and I was probably in business nearly factories have shut down too probably right yeah yeah so a lot of people were looking to learn how to manufacture in the UK um because obviously yeah like they were finding it really hard to import things So I was realizing people asking the same questions over and over and over again about how to get started, how to make it profitable. And I thought, why don't I say the same answers to everybody in one room at one time, which pretty much ended up turning into a course about how to start a fashion brand. That did really well. And where 100% of my income was one-to-one work I would say now it's maybe like 30% and 70% is courses so it literally did a 180 in lockdown and it does just it's like the reverse of charging time for money it's more like a package that people can see a transformation from and what I enjoyed was seeing where my career was like started off as manufacturing and buying products and then moved in to be a sales role. Weirdly, working for myself has followed the same pattern. So I helped people get their fashion brand off the ground. And then they came back to me and was like, cool, I've got it. I've got all the product in a warehouse. Now what? Like, can you also help me sell it? I really enjoyed working with you. Can we go and, and like talk about this now? 
And I had massive imposter syndrome at the beginning because I don't have a degree in marketing, but I do have like five years working as a sales manager. And so I, I was really honest and just said, you know, like I've grown my business on Instagram. I understand how I marketed my business. Maybe there's some transferable skills there. I can also talk to you about sales and building relationships. And honestly, like that's all marketing is anyway. Um, So it's just building those relationships with people, learning how to talk about your product in lots and lots of different ways and then asking for the sale. And it grew from there. So it just, it also felt a bit funny helping people create lots and lots of stock without helping them to learn how to sell it as well because it that's not sustainable as a business model and so the people I would say I still help people start um but now I also help them scale as well that's so interesting I mean you you can't have one without the other right (laughs) yeah exactly yeah like that's why I say manufacturing and marketing and mindset because they are all three key pillars of running a business yeah it's all connected let me turn off my calendar for that sound um yeah I mean let's talk about marketing let's just dive right into it yeah so where do you find your community having the most blockages when it comes to selling their work definitely assuming people aren't interested it's like they've shut the gate before they've even started so I have a bit of a mantra for people to just say assume they are interested before you've even begun before you even open your mouth to say anything assume people are interested because if you're assuming people assuming people aren't you're going to be like, oh, I've got this thing and you know, nobody's listening anyway, so what's the point? And like the energy just isn't there. Whereas if you're thinking some people who are following me might be interested, there is just like a little bit of added energy and interest that goes into that post. Um, So I don't know, I always talk about what I've got on my desk. I've got this like silk hairband and it's like made of silk. So it doesn't... Um, affect your curly hair and you know it doesn't snag and you can wear it up you can wear it down it like the elastic goes in and out it doesn't overstretch it doesn't snap and you start thinking about things that people would actually be interested in to do with the hairband and I just thought well if nobody's going to be interested in buying hairbands like what's the point in even talking about them I think that's the approach that people take and then they create content from that perspective the content doesn't do very well because it doesn't have any effort or energy put into it or the right energy and effort, I should say. And they're, then they're like, oh, I knew it. Nobody was interested. I told you. And it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> um, I can see you're nodding your head. <laughs> do, you feel, do you find a similar thing, even though we're like miles and miles and miles away? Is it the same there? Oh my God. No, this, this really resonates. And this resonates personally because, um, and this is something I'm very public with our, I may have started with our apparel line, but that is, uh, less than 10% of our revenue at this point. Yeah. And it, I mean, you know, we could dive into my blockages, blockages around it, but, um, uh, we like semi recently separated our apparel into its own account if you will. Um, And I've sort of taken that on again as my baby and we haven't produced um, more apparel in a while. Although this season I sort of got re-inspired. We did some work to uh, create some new items and feel inspired again. But like, man, still, is it, I don't know why I feel, I feel, well, I'm saying this now. I don't know. I have a hard time selling services and and products all the time. I mean, I I teach about selling services and products, but it's hard and it's like personal and it's like this big, uh, weight and it's, it's heavy. It like just feels hard. And, um, you know, we have these new bumper stickers and uh, I was so excited about them and they've, you know, we've made a couple sales and, you know, they're in process for a a couple retail stores, but like, it seems, I'm just like, oh man, like no one wants to see this and I'm going to throw up a video about it anyways. And, 
But like, wow, what a mindset shift to just be like, okay, well, actually everyone wants to know about this. They just haven't purchased it yet. You have to talk about it. They're waiting for the right time. It's hard to get anyone to buy anything, not yes. because of the money, but like because of, I mean, it could be about the money. It could be about too much stuff. Um, if we're talking about bumper stickers, right? Maybe they don't have any more room on their car for a bumper sticker, or maybe, you know, they're sick and tired of fighting for abortion rights, you know, even though, <laughs> you know, all sorts of reasons. And um, yeah, it is really, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the way people try and sell, this is like my thing that I keep banging on about recently, they assume everybody is ready to buy. And so their call to action is always go away and buy, go and buy, click the link in my bio, go and buy it. And it's like, whoa, 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 some people might just want to know about the stickers, how they were created, why you created them, where they came from, some inspiration and uh, some funny memes about bump stickers or like a funny video and just something that's a little bit lighter because some people may have just found you today. Some other people may have had a bit of a poke around on your website or they just like following you. Some other people might have looked at your bumper stickers, but also someone else's bumper stickers and like started comparing them and they're just waiting to get paid um, until they decide. And then other people are ready to buy. So that's like four camps of people. And if you break them up into quarters, you have to speak to all of those people at all of those stages. And what people do is they only speak to the 25% of people who are actually ready to buy and they ignore everybody else. And can you break down those other categories? So someone who's ready to buy. Someone who's ready to buy, somebody who's interested in you, somebody who's interested in you and the product, and then somebody who is ready to commit. So if they are like, the other way you could say it is they're cold, they're warm, they're hot, they're ready. And so they go through these four stages. And so you have to speak to the cold people and move them to the warm stage. Sometimes you have to speak to the warm people and move them to the hot stage. And then the hot people, you move on to the ready to buy section. And then you go around again. So what are some call to actions to use for the other folks that aren't ready to buy? I would say something like, here's where I've got my inspiration from, what inspires you? I would say mm. the other three areas are more asking for engagement. So it might mm. just be around asking question because say I hear a lot from people like, oh, my engagement is rubbish. And it's because you're not asking for it. There is nothing to engage with. You're just saying, mm. here's a mood board. What, what do you want me to say? Like cute, love, pink heart emoji, there is nothing to say if you were like here's my mood board where like what do you prefer creating on Pinterest or in paper then you'll get loads of comments it is literally just about asking more questions and so if you're showing up like nothing 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 buy my stuff you come across kind of bossy because you're only telling people what to do and nobody wants like a bossy friend. <laughs> you know, you're like, if you go and meet somebody, they're like, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Why are you not doing that? Whereas if you go and meet a friend and they're like, how are you? How's everything going? Tell me what you've been up to. Oh, by the way, I've been doing this. Are you interested? It feels much more free flowing. And so putting that online and you say, here's my inspiration. Where do you get yours? What do you prefer? I can't decide whether to do this in pink or blue. What do you think? Now it's ready to buy. Do you want to buy it? That's a much love, like, an, it just feels like a nicer journey. And you're, by asking people lots of questions and asking them to engage with you, that's almost like a practice run at asking them to buy from you because you get used, to, they, you're training them to engage with you in a really low touch way. And so then when you ask them to engage with you in a financial way, they've had a bit of practice at that. Does that make sense? Yes, it's gold. I love it. I love it so much. Um, so I'm 
what other, okay, let's talk about like what other methods there are to take people through these customer journeys. So what other platforms or ways uh, do you suggest that creatives or small fashion brands or anyone really listening um, talk to their community? Yeah, well, I would say try and pick like two or three platforms that do different jobs. So I recently made a video about how I'm not doing TikTok this year for business because it was giving me heart palpitations (laughs) about how fast the content was and how much it needed. And I thought, if I'm going to take that off my plate, what am I going to put on there instead? And I, I needed something that would attract new people because TikTok is a really great place to be discovered. So I thought I need to either put that time into PR, I need to do talks, I need to do ads, or I need to focus on my SEO, something like that. So they would all be good replacements for TikTok, in my opinion, because they're all like top of funnel things for new people to find you. So that's like, if you think about top of funnel is like discovery, then there is nurture. I think there is no better place for this other than Instagram. It is so well set up to nurture people through videos, through DMs, the conversations that you have with people, the highlights, the stories. There is so many ways to nurture an audience through that platform. So I would say that's my middle platform is the nurture. And then you need a platform to sell. And for me, that is email. And so I'm really happy with having, so where I took out TikTok, I ended up doing ads instead. So mine is like ads, Instagram, organic. um, And then it was email. For other people, it might look completely different, but just trying to make sure you haven't, you're not focusing on three platforms that are all good at discovery or three platforms that are all good at nurture, or three platforms that are all good at selling, because otherwise you're going to just like run out of leads or run out of money. That's so fascinating. I don't actually think I've ever really thought about it that directly as TikTok um, being top of funnel, Instagram being more nurturing, and then email bottom of funnel. Um, Yeah. I think that's really, really fascinating. And so I think that's a really interesting way to think about alternatives too. So if you don't like TikTok, um, maybe Pinterest. I think Pinterest could be top of funnel also. Yeah. Um, Blogging. I mean, what? Go ahead. Blogging. Blogging. Yeah. But then like Instagram, you could swap Instagram out for YouTube. I think YouTube is a really good uh, nurturing platform for more long form content. So yeah, just like try and replace one that has the same purpose because not every platform has the same purpose. Yeah. So in terms of your ads, what sort of ads are running? Are you running a lead magnet or what's, tell us about your ad process. Yeah. So I have three course launches a year and for each course launch, I run a free challenge But before the free challenge, I have a freebie lead magnet download. So at the moment, I've got a free 30 day sales planner. So I'll say, you know, if you're looking to sell consistently, you need to be selling consistently, like actively selling your products consistently in order to get those consistent sales. Don't know how to do it. Here's a free 30 day sales planner with different prompts to try each day then that will lead into the free challenge. And then that free challenge will lead into the course. Um, And so I'm running ads. I'm speaking about this as a total newbie, might I add, to ads. I feel like I've pretty much like learned a new language now that I understand ads slightly about return on investment and cost per click and all of those things. Um, So... I'm running ads for those three different phases of the course launch. And then separate to that, I know people always tell you not to boost posts on Instagram. 
But I have actually had quite an all right experience with it because I heard on a podcast years ago that you're allowed to boost a post as long as the call to action is free. So don't expect anyone to buy anything off of boasting. Like that's a totally different ball game. But I, if you come and find me on Elizabeth Styles UK on Instagram, you'll see that I run a lot, like create lots of memes. And they're all like silly and funny about like small business life. And I sometimes boost them. But the caption is like, hi, I'm Elizabeth, I can help you with this, come and follow me for this. Here's what one of my clients has said about working with me. And so I have seen my following grow quite nicely just from putting like two or three pounds a day behind that meme. Because the other thing is that is, it's content that would perform well anyway, organically. And nobody expects a meme to be an ad. So it gets a good reaction because people are so tuned to ads now um, that you can almost spot one from a mile off. But I feel like I've hacked the system slightly (laughs) by boosting this meme to get people to follow me. And that is probably another way that I thought, okay, well, how about I spend two or three pounds a day boosting this meme in order to get people to follow me versus like spending an hour every day creating content for TikTok that gets like 40 views. So yeah, I've got like a proper ad strategy, but then I've also got my own like little hack that I try that seems to be working. I love that. And I love the memes. We are also pro memes and we have like a little guide (laughs) about how to make a meme too. Um, And I think using humor or um, I think memes also, they type, they tap into humor and they tap into pain points. Yes. Um, And I know that's a controversial word and, you know, but they tap into our feelings. We feel something when we see memes and I think that's really potent. I know because sometimes I, when I talk about creating memes, It sounds like a silly conversation, but I'm glad that you brought that up, that marketing is speaking to people's emotions. And a meme does that in a really light touch way, rather than being like, do you feel like this? Do you feel like this? In that same tone over and over again, whereas a meme is more like that feeling when, and it's the same message, you're still speaking to the feeling, but you're almost like, making light of it and then people go oh that's so me ha ha or that's so Phoebe I'm gonna send it to her um and so it's very shareable and I've as well yeah like I've seen a really good reaction from creating them because I love it there is nothing that makes me happier than when somebody comments on my page like oh my god that's so me how did you know it feels like you're inside my head because it shows me that I understand my customer really well. And I, I'm just like, yes, I've nailed it. <laughs> um, I also see people doing memes like really, really badly. Um, and the the image has to be funny. The words have to be snappy. They have to be the exact right humor for the audience that you're speaking to. So yeah, it, it's definitely not just like a picture with words. There is like a bit more to it than that, I think. Let's talk shiny object syndrome. Yes. Um, what is shiny object syndrome and how, yeah, just let's start there. Yeah, I did a post on this the other day that was like, I call shiny object syndrome SOS because it is an actual warning sign for your business if you keep getting distracted by creating new things and if we think about feeling guilty about that who (laughs) identifies who thinks that they are being productive and being busy within their business creating new products or new colorways or new versions of things that are on your website rather than selling the thing that you have. And it's because creating products is probably very much within your comfort zone and selling the products is probably very much outside of your comfort zone. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> so what you do is rather than thinking, well, what te- people tend to think is like, maybe it's not selling is because I don't have it in blue. And so what I'm going to do is go away and create a blue one. And then you put it on the website. Oh, it's still not selling. Maybe it's because I don't have it in pink. I'm going to go away and create a pink one and then put that on the website. It's not selling because you're not selling it. You're not, you've not figured out how to sell it effectively. And so it's a bit of a trap that you fall into by thinking I'm going to create more products to be productive. You're going to go around in circles and send yourself crazy and I see it really often where people end up with an expensive hobby creating lovely products and not selling anything because there is a big difference between having a hobby and having a business and one makes money and one doesn't and it's because one has sales and one doesn't one has customers and one doesn't and besides that you're totally allowed to be creative and make all the things in blue and pink and whatever colors you like not everything has to be sold and I think because it's so easy to sell things now like you might make some scrunchies for your friends and they all love them they go oh you should put them on Etsy and you should make some money and you're like uh okay and like maybe you just want to make scrunchies for your friends and that's totally fine like you don't have to monetize every single ounce of your creativity there might be that you make headbands and you sell them but then you make scrunchies for your friends and you don't sell them like you don't have to make money off of everything and that's fine so how do we sell the things that are sitting around are you someone who believes in sales or like I'm sitting here looking at some you know older inventory that hasn't been selling in a little bit what how do we do it how do we sell it The biggest, most obvious thing that I think people don't do is ask for people to buy it. And I know that sounds really silly, but they might be talking about the story and talking about what they had for lunch and taking their dog out for a walk and putting that on stories and then saying, you know, they're working on a new collection, but then nobody has any idea what is actually for sale. And so that would be my first really obvious piece of advice is remember every now and then to put a link in the stories and say, this is available to buy. Then it's about giving people a reason to buy. So that could be from a limited amount of stock, a limited time promotion offer. Maybe you do like free delivery for the next 24 hours or something. So giving people a reason to buy is great. The other thing I would say is like, why now? Why do people need it right now? So in the UK in May, as we're recording this, there are three bank holidays. One is to do with the King's coronation. One is like a summer bank holiday and another one is another bank holiday. But it's like, what do people do on bank holidays? They go to barbecues, they go to see friends, they might book a long weekend away and think about how you can wrap your product into what they might be up to. So it has been so grey here in the UK and yesterday and today the sun is finally out and my inbox is just full of brands saying it's a sunny weekend like you need these dresses this weekend next day delivery and so just really like notice how other people are selling stuff and think how could I apply that to my business Um, and then the last thing I would probably say is Whilst it's really important to talk about the features of your product, it's even more important to talk about the benefits of your product. So I want to use my cotton top that I am wearing um, and it is black and white stripe and it's long sleeve. And I can describe the top, but why does that matter to your customer? Okay. It's 100% cotton, so it is really breathable in the summer, but also will keep you warm in the winter. It's a black and white stripe. So, so what? Like, if you imagine your customer literally saying so what to you over and over and over again, kind of like an annoying little child, like, so what, so what, so what? And try and come up with an answer. 
it's like so it would go with loads of your clothes so you could wear it with lots of different colors you could wear it with jeans you could wear it with this you could wear it out you could wear it in the day you could probably wear it to work and so like you've got to not only I think people say the obvious but then don't say why it matters to the customer in order to actually buy it yeah I love that I love all that (laughs) Um, well, I know we didn't talk too much about manufacturing, but I think we really, uh, talked a lot about the selling, which I think is awesome. Um, where can people find you if they want to work with you for the manufacturing part or, I mean, or the selling part? Yeah. Um, so I have two courses. One is called the visibility project, which is about moving people through that customer journey through your content. And I also have another course called the sales project, which is all about the black and white stripey t-shirt, like how to sell something and how to make your customer care about selling the thing. Um, So they're my two main courses, or you can just come and follow me at Elizabeth Styles UK. We can work together one-to-one or just come for the memes and for the lols like have a good time I'm often on there making a fool of myself I like talking you can drop me in the dms and have a chat with me share your story share your experience like I spend an unhealthy amount of time on instagram so definitely come and talk to me over there this has been so lovely Elizabeth thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and your wisdom um and yeah thank you again My pleasure. Thank you for having me.